Hi, can everybody hear me? Good, thank you. So I changed my microphone. Does it work for you? Why? So would you say again, can you hear me? Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so let's start today. So what we will cover today is an eager functional language, which is a bit, I mean, which forms, which we, we are getting a bit closer to the real world programming languages. So, yeah. first. Okay, right. So, so we studied about lambda calculus. So here's motivation. So we studied about lambda calculus, which formed the basis of many uh, functional programming languages. So, and in particular, we studied about lambda calculus. Eagle evaluation. So last time we used notation like this, and this forms the basis of functional languages for many actually the real world mainstream programming languages which support lambda expression. So typical example is a camel, Scala. Closure scheme. And in some to some extent, extent Java, Python, and so on. And even C anonymous function mechanisms, are, they are all based on the idea of evil evaluation. But if I mean so what we studied from the basis, but it's not the entire language. So in order to come up with some programming language, which is a bit closer, which is more usable to write more meaningful programs, we need to do something else. Okay? And this is something else uh, what we're going to study uh, in, in this lecture today on Wednesday. And what are the things that we need to do? So the first thing, so this is not convenient. Or programming. It's possible to do programming with the lambda calculus, but it's not very convenient to do so. So most real world programming languages do something more than lambda calculus. Then the two key things that we're gonna study in today and on Wednesday are support for primitive operation. and basic data and also we're going to study about support for recursion
So by primitive operations, I mean operations on integers and booleans and so on. When I explained the lambda calculus before, I said we can encode integers and booleans in untyped lambda calculus that we studied, but writing any code with this is very inconvenient and that's not what's really happening in real world programming languages. Okay, so the real world programming language is a very good support for these primitive operations, like operations on integers and so on. Also, they provide a way to construct a data type. So they, in OCaml, they were scholar. I mean, people, when they programming while in functional style, they use so-called uh, algebraic data type quite a bit that correspond to what we call alternative type constructor. And also tuples are very common in OCaml and Scala. They correspond roughly, I mean, some poor version of objects, but if you are familiar, more familiar with C, it corresponds to struct in C. And so, so they provide something that you can use to build a data type and also perform basic operations. Also, this uh, functional programming language on top of eagle evaluation provide a specific support for recursions, okay? And that is because I mean, supporting recursion in the context of eagle evaluation is a bit tricky. And so I'm gonna explain a little bit about this and it's gonna be, it is a bit tricky. So one has to be a bit careful about this. Okay. So, so the, these operations, so these are the things needed in a real world functional, which means programming language whose main computation mechanism is by function definition and application functional programming language. So we're gonna study about these two and we will study about main principles behind these two. So I'm not really going to, so my goal is not really teach you specific programming language, it's more about what are the principles that you can use to extend the core lambda calculus with these extra facilities. So later when you encounter some need to extend a programming language with some different feature, you know what to do. So that's what my objective of these lectures. Let me tell you a bit more about this support for the recursion and why it is a bit tricky. So this is a bit tricky in so giga function programming languages. Okay. So now my motivation is mainly based from the semantics. So if you think about recursions, typical way of interpreting recursion is in terms of fixed point. One of the typical recursion that we studied before when in the context of imperative language is a loop. And the way we did was we used this fixed point theorem from domain theory, which says that if we have a function f that goes from domain d to domain d, if it's a continuous function, then this function has a this fixed point. So such a list fixed point exists. So that was the list fixed point theorem. And so the way we interpreted the, some the so -called loop, which is a simple version of recursion, is by picking the right D and also picking the right F. And then we interpret the loop as the list fixed point of that operator. Okay. Now, if we want to do something similar for the functional language, here's a problem. Okay, so that was what we did. But in the, I will just write eva EFL before the eva functional language. You can think of this as a lambda calculus on the eva evaluation. What is the problem? The problem is now if we need, should be able to have some way to write function f in this eagle functional language that goes I mean, to follow this recipe to, to that goes from domain D to D, okay? 
So that should be, in some sense, expressible in the CFM. But if you, one thing, one representative feature of EVA evaluation is that it evaluates its arguments before function application. Semantically, what does that mean is everything that you can write in EVA functional language, if you use it to define a function that goes from D to B, is every expressible function is going to be strict, which means that F of a bottom is going to be equal to bottom. So what's the problem here? The problem is that now bottom is a fixed point, and that's not what we want. I mean, if you define a loop, semantics of the loop is always doesn't terminate all the time. So that is going to be the semantics. That would be the semantics. Then that's going to be a disaster. I mean, we are not really interpreting anything. So the, everything expressible in eager functional language, they are strict. They all have a fixed point, trivial fixed point, which is bottom. So this is not a viable option because we don't get anything. So what we have to do instead is that one thing we will learn, maybe you forgot now, but one thing we have studied is that in the ego functional language, this domain D that we used was actually the domain of values together with extra bottom elements, lifted bottom elements. So what we have to do instead is that we have to define a function G instead that goes from V to V okay. in order to define the recursions in the support the recursion. So we need some way, some syntactic restriction that allows us to define function G that goes from V to V. Okay, why that's the syntactic restriction? It's a syntactic restriction because if we just write a function G in ego functional language, that's going to be a function from V to V bottom, so which is equal to D. So this is so general function. in ego functional language. But what we, this is what we want. So we have to be a bit more careful. I mean, we need to put some syntactic restrictions so that we have to be sure the function we are defining always return value. It never does mean this one in the bottom say for certain inputs, the program this G may, may not terminate, but the one above said, for every input, G is always going to terminate. So we should have some way to write functions that is guaranteed to terminate. So recursion is only defined with respect to such a function. So that's the first issue we have to think about, how to put language restriction to ensure termination when we define recursion. So the second issue is that this, I mean, although this V in the denotational semantics that we studied is, is a, I mean, it's a domain. In general, V is not a domain. It's not. Okay, so what does that mean? But it is a pre domain. In other words, V, it's it, every increasing chain has a list of bound, but it doesn't necessarily have a smallest element. So what should we have to restrict G such a way that this is a function G is defined over some subset of a V, where this subset has the list elements. Okay. So more, so then that will boils down to really we are I mean in the particular design decisions we are making, we are following, we this we're gonna use we will set V0 to be on the function space, uh, so-called we the function space that goes from, uh, so let's not talk about this. I think it will only make you more confused. So what we have to do is we have to restrict the V0. So the, in functional language, the support for recursion is always of very specific form. Is this only for, only you are allowed to use recursions only when you are defining recursive functions. So that's, I mean, really 
was there to meet these two criteria. We want my function to always, my G always terminate. Also, we, I want that G is defined not with respect to entire V, but with respect to some subset V0. And project A, it, uh, support for the recursion in functional language is designed such a way that it meets both of these requirements. I think this is a bit abstract, but I hope that you get the idea that there is some issue of supporting recursion in functional language. Okay, so let's see. And go into the main topics. So now we're going to define. So the first topic, which is a support for primitive operation. And data types. Well, okay. So to do so, let me remind you of what we studied before. So here's a quick reminder of the lambda calculus on the ego evaluation. The syntax of the lambda calculus is like this. We have an expression. An expression has either variables or lambda abstraction. And then function multiplication. And then we identify the certain subset of expression as canonical form. And then the canonical form are the ones that's going to be produced by evaluator, so which follow this ego evaluation strategy. And the canonical form in this case was just functions. Okay, make some space here. So we have canonical form. So, and then also canonical form can be understood as a so-called denotable value. What are the kind of values that can be denoted by some computations in this language? And then the denotable values in this uh, runtime values in this case was the lambda expressions. So that's, we can call it functional canonical form. And then the functional canonical form. What's the lambda expression? Okay. And then we define the evaluator, the operational semantics, which is we define the evaluation relation. And then we use define evaluation relation with the two rules. The first rule was the canonical form rule. We say if we have Z, it's a canonical form. So if it, Z represents a canonical form, if we have a canonical form, canonical form get evaluated to itself. Okay. So that was the one of the rules. The second rule was for the function application. So sometimes called it a beta ego evaluation. It says, if you have an expression application E1 and E2, we when we evaluate application, we first evaluate E1. So yeah, everything is subscripted with E, but I'm gonna omit E in, the, in this lecture. So if E1 gets evaluated to the canonical form, X E1 prime, and then ego evaluation, we also evaluate these arguments. So arguments get evaluated to the canonical form Z2. So then we apply to the function application where we evaluate the body of the function where the parameter X is bound to the evaluated argument Z2. 
And if that produces of Z, that's going to be the output of the entire thing. Yeah. So that was the rough summary about before, I mean, without the notation of semantics. This was the rough summary about how we did. Now, we want to extend this programming language to support primitive operations and data types. So what should we do? Okay. And then, so here's a general principle that we have, we can, can follow. But so first, okay, let me just write it. So what we need to do is we need to extend each of these case, the principle. components from above. So we extend each of these three components from above. But then the way we extend it is, is following the following kind of general methodology. The methodology said, think about runtime type. Think about runtime type that is closely related to the kind of things that we want to add. And then once you think about runtime type, think about the constructor that builds elements of this runtime types. And then also destructor that destroys or the decompose the, the runtime type that you constructed. Structures. Corresponding. So think about one, one time type and then corresponding constructors and destructors. Now, once you think about this, then what we have to do, we exchange. So this is the overall picture. And think about the runtime type and constructor and destructor. Now we're gonna extend each of this. We extend canonical form. So add a new case to CFM to account for. the new runtime type. So we think about run new runtime type, and then now we're gonna add one more case to canonical form to account for the new runtime type. Why is that? That is because we are now extended our language. So the, during the, comp the, the computation, the programs in the language now is able to express not just the functions, but also elements of this new runtime type that we're gonna end, okay? So that's why it's a canonical form, which express which kind of runtime values we have. We have a one more case because we extended it. And then now the actual for the definitions, then we have to include one more case for the canonical form for the new runtime type, but then we use constructors. This case, okay. To define the case, and then next thing we have to do is we have to change the syntax. With both constructors and destructors. Finally, 
this, I mean, this is a general recipe. So sometimes we deviate a little bit, or quite a bit, but give you a good guideline about what needs to be done. So we need to add two rules, or possibly one. One, uh, two, the definition of evaluation, one for constructor. Uh, actually one for computing the components of the constructor and the other for destructor. Okay, so I think the best way to understand what's happening is to see that example. So I mean, just give you a quick uh, recall about some keywords that I just explained to you. What well, to add a new type, you do data type into the programming language. One, what we have to think about is think about runtime type and constructor and destructor. And I explained a very complicated way, but constructor, constructors are closely related to the canonical form. So that's what I want you to keep in mind. And then the, for the evaluations, definition of the evaluation, we need a two rules, one for the construct composing, con computing the component of the constructor. The other is for you, the explaining what's really happening in the destructor. Okay, I will tell you more about this second part, which, so in general, I mean, this type of, the second type of evaluation rule is called a beta rule, but I'm gonna tell you what, I mean, why we can call all these things as a beta rule. Okay, so let's follow this recipe to, and, to do to add so-called alternative type, okay? Uh, maybe instead of alternative type, let's add a topics. Okay. So what we want to do? So the next task we want to do is add a topo data plan. So by, by, by topper, I mean, I want to be, I want to extend my programming language so that I can express something like three, four, five. That's a topple of three elements. The first element contains three, second is four, the third is five. And also I want to be, should be able to write some expressions like three, four, some expression. E. And then I want to take, it's the first component with a dot zero projection. Or maybe more generally, I want to write something like dot one. This means the first projection of the second component. And this kind of things appears in programming languages all the time. I mean, nearly all the programming languages provide some way of writing tuples, either like this, like a camel, Scala, I think Java also supports maybe the, the, this way of writing tuples. And some other languages provide a way to write in so-called named tuples, which some, sometimes you call a short, okay? So that we can name the first component as say, age, the second component is the year and so on. Okay, so what should we do to support this? But according to the recipe, we have to include a runtime type and then think about constructor and destructor and change that what we wrote above based on this uh, these three components, runtime type, constructor, and destructor. So that's what we're gonna do. So we look at this language and then we're gonna add runtime type. And I said adding runtime type really corresponds to adding one more case to the canonical form because canonical form identifies what are the values that is being computed by this language. And each case really corresponds to a different type of values uh, produced by expressions in this language. So we're gonna add the one case, which is called topo canonical form. And then 
the top of canonical form, now we have to define what it is. And it's defined in terms of constructor. So that, that's what I told you here. So we add a new case. So we just added a new case. And then we said, we now we need to define what that new case is. And then to define the new case, what the new case is, we only think about construct. I mean, that makes sense because the time. Um, so for, I, I didn't tell you what construct and destructors are. For canonical form, the constructor and destructor is going to be, constructor is going to be this angle bracket operation that allows to build tuples. Destructor is going to be this projection operation that allows to decompose or look at the components of tuples. Okay. If destructor allows you to look at elements there, constructor allows you to build a new elements of the, this new data. So the, the recipe tells us to focus on the constructor when we define the new the, the give a definition of the, this uh, canonical form. That's what we're gonna do. So we have a new constructor like this, angle brackets. And then in, in the canonical form, it's a something that's completely evaluated by this program, uh, by, by, uh, by the evaluator, by operation, the eva evaluation relation of the, this language. So the, each component should also have a canonical form. So we add a new type and we define it in terms of a constructor. And constructor said, if you have a bunch of canonical form, if you construct something by this angle bracket notations, then you will have a tuple canonical form, okay, tuple values. Now, the, the next part said we have to change the syntax so that the syntax contains both a constructor and destructor. And that's what we're gonna do. So we are add to a few more cases. One case is that we want it to support this constructor. So we have a constructor like this. So we need a way, we have a way to build tuples. And also we have a way to destroy tuples. I don't know which application I use. So there's something called the tech. And, and tag is just natural numbers. So zero, one, two, and so on. Okay, so we follow the complete the recipe up to step name two, three, and four. Now we have to change the number five. Number five said we have to add a few new rules. The one rule is for the, the constructor, the other is for the destructor. In the case of a tuple, the rule for constructor looks like this. So if we have a constructor with expression E1, E0, up to Em minus one. If I evaluate this, the top, uh, this constructor doesn't do anything, but it allowed, uh, what we, it allowed, this rule allows us to evaluate components of this, this uh, top of constructor. So in this case, we're gonna evaluate E0 to get E0, E1 to get Z1, so on, and E n minus one to get Z n minus one. And we put, the outcome of this evaluation together. C0 to C minus one. And then you can see that this is a legitimate canonical form. That is because the, now the tuple canonical form said it can be, if you form 
a topple by putting uh, canonical forms together, that's going to be a canonical form. And that's exactly what we are used to. But this is, in a sense, not a very interesting computation. It's just that if we have a constructor, then you can, if uh, something constructor applies somewhere, then you can evaluate, you need, we can evaluate the arguments of the constructor. A more interesting bit happens by this, the other root for the destructor. Destructor case, we have an expression D together with a tag K. Uh, so by the way, I'm not going to write this uh, subscript E when I, from now on, because I mean, for simplicity, but you can imagine that subscript E is everywhere whenever I write this uh, evaluation relation. So I, in this case, we first evaluate these arguments of projection operation. If the argument gives a tuple, if it doesn't give a tuple, we don't do anything, but it gives, gives a tuple. And, and then if the tag k is smaller than n, so that tag k, I mean, really denotes one of the components, then we return zk. So this describes, I mean, this is the really the computation step that's happening. It describes I mean, the, some, uh, the, the projection operator does the projection, but it has a general form. The general form is, I mean, really this a sub expression E here that build a tuple, and then this dot K, it immediately destroys the tuple, okay? So E applies a constructor. So con E build a tuple, so it applies a constructor, and then, dot k, it, by applying the projection, it destroys, apply the destructor. In other words, constructor followed by destructor, and that's going to be the, what we have, what we started with, which is the case component. So this pattern of evaluation relation, definition of evaluation, or case of evaluation relation, is called beta root, more generally. I mean, it may have some subscript like beta tuple, but the pattern is construct, then destruct. It's the same as, it's roughly the same as identity. So that's the, the what people call beta rules. And in fact, this beta evaluation rule that you see in the lambda abstract and an application follow a similar pattern. If you look at E1, E1 constructs functions by producing the lambda expression. And then we immediately destroy the, this lambda expression by E2, okay? So we construct by building lambda expression and we destruct it immediately by applying this function. So in that case, we're gonna have something close to identity, which is the body of this function E1, E1 prime. But because it's a function core, we do the so we, we do the appropriate substitution. So, but generally this one also follows the same pattern. Construct followed by destruct does behave almost like an identity, or something uh, very some variants of identity. And so both of them are really co uh, are called beta rules. So there are something called eta rules which it doesn't appear the, this type of evaluation, but appear more in the study, former study of logic. And that goes the opposite direction. If you destruct it and then construct it, so instead of construct and destruct, you change the swap the order, and that also become behave a bit like identity. That is called the eta rule. But in the, uh, in the, the this eval definition of evaluation relation, this is what we are talking. Okay, so, so this is what we did. And now we want to add a few, a few more cases. So here's some exercise I want you to do. So the fourth case actually is blue.
Uh, so you can define a function that behaves, that's right. So if you want to apply the, get the multiple index, then you first bind this tuples into some variable and then applying this, uh, say applying this destructor for the first component and second component. So, so for the Juyan's question, Juyan asked me, uh, okay, good. So, so then here's an exercise that I want you to think about as a data type for alternative. So what does this mean? This means I'm going to give you some concrete expressions that appears here. Concrete expressions are, suppose I want to I mean, consider case I think this is a bit hard for you because you haven't any express, you know, experience with uh, data type or algebraic data type in OCaml or Scala, then maybe not quite come to you, but, but it's worth to think about. So suppose we want to construct a type where which have multiple different cases, and each case have a different, I mean, yeah, so we want to have, have a multiple cases. So then we can build some that kind of things by saying, Putting this add notation, we say add zero true means we are having a value boolean, but this boolean correspond to the I mean the, this is zero. Uh, so if we when you put alternative, it correspond to zero to alternative, and for the same thing, we can say for the, we want to put a first alternative that has a value, say, tuple three and four. And then we also have a second alternative that may have a value function, okay, lambda x identity function. So we want to put, so when you write using, writing program using these alternatives, we are really defining a data type which have a different cases. The first case is really correspond to Boolean. Second case correspond to the pair, pair of integers in this case. The third case correspond to the two functions. So where, okay, so this is a way to construct alternate elements in the alternative. Okay, just. Then if we want to destroy it, then for use it, here's uh, something that we can use. This is the syntax. Some case expression P of zero. So if you're familiar with pattern matching in some programming language, this really corresponds to the pattern matching. This some case means that it evaluate expression E. If expression E say turn out to be the first one at zero and true, then what we're gonna do is we will pick the first alternative E0 and we're gonna apply E0 to true. So if we're gonna be reduced, well contract it, when you apply uh, you run to the runtime, we'll, we'll pick E0, and then we will apply E0 to the argument tree. And then computation will con continue from there. If this case is at one, three, and four, what's gonna happen is that instead of picking E0, it's gonna pick E1. And then you will apply this tuple three and four to E1 and computation will continue and so on. So this is some case does the case analysis over this alternative text. And, and these two combined together allows us to do many interesting, writing many interesting programs. Okay. So let me just give you, I mean, I want, one thing I want you to learn is how to design a programming language. So I will explain what these features are, and then I will ask you to extend the things that I explained to you about. Okay. So what are the 
interesting example in this language. In this example, we can uh, use this these alternatives to define trees. Okay, but the trees trees have uh, two cases. One is a leaf. So say the leaf is tagged with zero, and say leaf always contain the value integer values like a three. So leaf. This is always an integer. And then we also have to say nodes, which is not a leaf in a tree. And then we do it by saying it's a tagged one, and it's a pair. It consists contains consists of the left subtree and the right subtree. This is a tree, and R is also a tree. So this is our definition of tree uh, in this language. Now, so then using this, we can express many kinds of trees. The first one tree we can write is, if you want to write trees, something like a three, four, five. And this kind of tree can be expressed as F1, left F1, at zero, three, at zero, four, at zero, five. Okay, so we have a node that corresponds to this guy, another node that corresponds to this guy, and then appropriate leaves there. Now, suppose we, these are the trees that we, this is how we're gonna represent the tree using these alternatives. Suppose that we want to write program that computes. Uh, so, so actually, I mean, you can't really do the computation at this point. You need a recursion. So, so these are the kind of trees. Now, one thing we want to do is that suppose we want to write a function that return true if my tree is a I mean, tree is just a leaf. If it's not a leaf, it returns false. Then we can write function like this. We said on the x, we do some case over x. If the first case is a zero, zero tag case, which is correspond to leaf. So in that case, we said given a tr uh, tree, we return true. Tree, it's not a tree. Given integer i, we return true. And then one case is the is a tuple. So given tuple t, and we return false. Um, we have to talk about this true, false, and integers. I mean to express uh, this language, which we're gonna do soon. But the point I'm making is that this is how we can use it. Now, here's an exercise I want you to do. Now, extend the language to support to support these are uh, this alternative. Type. Sometimes instead of alternative, it's called some type. So here's these things, and then what you need to do is to, to go back to the definition, and then have to change the canonical form, change uh, definition of expression, also change the definition of this evaluation. So I will give you in three minutes to do so.
Uh, the problem statement is to ex extend this language, the expression, the, the abstract syntax for expression, canonical form, definition of evaluation relation, so that the language support the alternative data type that I just explained to you. So alternative data type contains this add tag k and expression, and also this is some case. And if the one here correspond to the constructor, this correspond to the destructor. So based on that information, try to extend, extend the this abstract grammar as well as the definition of canonical form, the definition of evaluation. Okay, so I mean, this is a bit, uh, it's an easy question, but it may be a bit difficult to some, to some of you because it's a bit vague. Okay, so what we have to do. So the recipe I explained to you to extend the language with a new data type or a new type is to include, I mean, think about the runtime type and then think about constructor and destructor and change canonical form based on constructor expression uh, with constructor and destructor and the evaluation we need to include the two rules one for constructor the other for the destructor and destructor rules is what i call beta rule which is construct immediately followed by destruct is going to be almost identical so how can we do it so for the alternative type so we include alternative can i go for and in doing so, we are really saying in this language, while programs are being evaluated, there are three kinds of runtime types. I mean, the, 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 the programs will produce values, and these values will be grouped into three, three runtime types. The first is a function, second is a tuple, the third is an alternative, in other words, some types. Okay, so. So then one, after including this uh, runtime type as a additional case of canonical form, we have to define uh, this alternative uh, canonical form. And alternative canonical form follow the definition, we follow exactly the, the recipe, which is we think about the constructor. We use constructor to define it here. The constructor was this S sign, which is building elements of this alternative uh, elements of this alternative type. So then this element will come with a tag, which was in my example, it was either zero, one, two, and so on. Okay. And then the now we, we need to put tag on in front of some elements. And then there's some element that has to be a canonical form. So. Okay. 
So by writing like this, we are really saying that whenever we write alternative to the, this construct, user constructor, its argument is going to be always going to be evaluated. And then for the syntax, we include both constructor and destructor. So we have uh, at tag and expression. So not a difference here. Here's an expression, here's a canonical form. And there's writing canonical form means when we, we write this at sign to construct an element of this alternative type, its argument is going to be going to get evaluated. So in other words, this add constructor, as well as this top constructor, they are behave a bit like an eagle evaluation, right? instead of like this normal order evaluation. And, and then the other destructor that we are writing is a sum case. And then some case contains first parameter as an expression. So that's the, the expression on which we do case analysis. And then for each of the cases, we have to, we have to provide the function that describe what we should do in each of the cases. That's going to be written like this expression. expression. Okay, so we handle the, the extension of canonical form and extension of expressions. Now we have to add rules for the evaluation. So let me create space here. And then I said the rule, we add the two rules, one for constructor, the other for the destructor. Constructor in this case is, we have a add tag k expression e. And the, the rule for constructor follow the same idea, which is just evaluate the argument and put the argument back inside the, as an argument for the constructor. So we evaluate each argument, if we get a canonical form, and pull it back to build an, an element of alternative like this. Okay. So you see that the, these two guys have a, exactly the same pattern. Right? And then now for the beta rules, we, we have to think about the structure. In this case, we have a E, no. so case of E0 up to E minus one. And we evaluate E, if we get that uh, are elements of this alternative type written as a constructor with a tag k. And we check the k is smaller, is in the appropriate range. So we can pick an appropriate alternative here. If that is the case, then we evaluate the in a sense, a handler for the k case, which is ek, to we apply it to the elements wrapped by this alternative constructor. And that's going to be the output like this. And again, you see that this but has a the, the principle that I explained, beta rules. I mean, we so e is an alternative, it applies a constructor, some is a destructor. So constructor followed by destructor behave a bit like identity in the sense that we just pick the some element before applying the constructor and do some computation about it. So these are the two rules. You can say this is a beta or two rules. And then the one below is just usual rule for the constructor. Okay. Now for, for the language, so this is a general principle that I followed. Think about runtime type, think about constructor and destructors, and then extend canonical form with new case for the runtime type. Use constructors to give a, to define this new case, extend the abstract grammar of expressions, 
and then add two rules for the, in the definition of evaluation relation, one for constructor, which is a very simple kind of a rule, and the other for destructor, which does this a bit, what I call this a beta action, which is construct followed by destruct is the same as identity. Okay. Now, uh, so one can do it. I mean, Jeho is right. So some some case, the second argument can be seen as a, some, some, you can say it's a topo, but that's not what people typically do. That's because what we really have to provide for some is really have to say, what should we do in each of these cases? So you can do it that way, but this is, uh, that's not what's typically done. So, and then in programming languages that support, so this is some case correspond to pattern match. And in the pattern match, they don't also mix, they in some case with a uh, with definition of topic. But what you said is right in principle. Okay, so now let me finish up the, by adding, talking about something really basic. So, so far I talk about how to support data type definitions, but to have a real programming language, we need to also have a primitive types. So my intention was to write everything here as blue. But so we also want to support for primitive operation, primitive values and operations about them. So what are the primitive values? Primitive values are either booleans and integers. And operations about them are like additions and conjunctions and so on. And we need them to do the computation. Okay, so what should we do here? And the, actually the handling primitive values are a bit similar to adding the data type that I just explained to you. And they correspond to, if we want to support the Boolean and integers, that really correspond to adding two runtime types, one for Boolean and the other for integers. Also, we have to think about constructor and destructors. You can do it if you are really, really formal, but we're gonna hand wave a little bit. And then we said constructors for primitive cases are just constant values. And and then we are not going to talk specifically about this structure, although it is possible to do so. so and then we, instead of this structure, we're gonna add a bunch of operation. So for primitive case, this rules follows in a bit, kind of not exactly, but roughly, you know, some approximately, okay? We think about runtime type, think about constructor, and then we think about operations on them. We define, extend the canonical form, extend expression and add a few rules in the evaluation relation to account for what really happens with these newly added primitive values and primitive types. Okay. So let's do this. So that for canonical form, now we add two more case, one for the Boolean, so it's a Boolean canonical form. And also we say integer canonical form. So, I mean, this loop became messy, but it's uh, still reasonably understandable. So then for Boolean canonical form, we, I said we need to add a constructor, but in this case, we are thinking about immediate constructor, which are Boolean constructor. So we have a true and false. And then integer case, we can add all the integer values that's from minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, and so on. So all the integer constants are going to be integer canonical form. That also makes sense because we, by canonical form, we are really talking about the final outcomes, final values of the integer type or Boolean type that's being produced by the programs here. And then final values for integers should be integers. Final values for Boolean should be Boolean values. 
For functions, we can't really say this, but for Booleans and integers, we can identify exactly what's gonna be, should be produced when computation is finished, okay? Completed in some sense. So then for expressions, we have a, we include all the constructors. So we include true, false, and integers like a minus two, minus one, and so on. But then we add a bunch of operations, typical operations. And these operations are, uh, yeah, so for, for these operations are like, uh, we have an expression, add another expression. Or maybe we have to take an expression and take a conjunction of another expression. So. But then some important bit that we also have to include here is that for Boolean, one important thing, it comes with dependence. So we also include dependence. Okay. So, I mean, I didn't write down all the things, but we have plus, we have a minus, and we have a, I mean, or, and then also we can compare two expressions using less than relation and so on. So there are many primitive operations we can include. Now, so after changing definition of canonical form and then definition of expressions, so some marking here. So there's um, then we have to change. Sorry about this. This is a bit messy. So, and then we have to change this, uh, the definition of the evaluation. And definition of evaluation is nothing special here because the, for, for the canonical forms, in this case, if it's true and false, they are all covered by this existing canonical form. The reason why things are so simple in this case is that our canonical form cases are just base case. It doesn't involve recursive core of another canonical unlike tuples and alternative case. So we don't really need to add anything, any new rules for the canonical form for primitive booleans and integers. They are all taken care of by existing this rule for canonical form. And, but we have to do some work. The work is about these operations like plus, plus operations or end operation and if then else operation. So here's a, an exercise I want you to, so let me just first write down the root for plus. So root for plus is also very simple. We said we have a E0 plus E1. And we want to evaluate this, then how do you do it? We first evaluate E0. And then we are only concerned with the case where we E0 produce an integer I0. So this is an integer. And also we are only concerned with the case where E1 produce an integer I1. If that is the case, we return the output, which is I0. I put a head to mean the real plus operation between two integers, not a syntactic plus sign, which is which appears in the in our definition of the program. So addition get interpreted as a mathematical addition. The same thing for and, same thing for multiplication and so on. So the definition for this case is pretty, I mean, very straightforward. Now we also have to talk about how to evaluate if then as expression. E0 plus E1. So this is an exercise for you. I will give you two minutes to do so. Okay, one minute to do so. So what should you write here? Okay.
Okay, so definition is really simple. So we have actually, we can write the two rules. So if E0, so E the condition part get evaluated to true, we evaluate this E0, get its canonical form, that's going to be output. And we have something similar for the false case. One that goes to C1. If E valid false, and then E1 valid to C1. Note that true and false case, if it's E is true, false branch is never again gonna get evaluated. If E is false, true branch will never get evaluated. That corresponds to your understanding about how it can Okay. Now remaining five minutes, I'm gonna talk about the recursion. So in the call by value, what I mean, the ego evaluation language is sometimes called call by value language. And in this language, question, we only allow to use recursion over functions. I mean, you can extend this, but that's gonna be what we will discuss when we start the semantics of this language. Okay, but for the reason that I vaguely explained in the beginning of this lecture, we have only limited support for the recursion. And then so the recursion case, we recursion doesn't add any new types. It's just the in terms of runtime, the, the values of denote types of runtime types of denotable values. Recursion doesn't add anything new, but it's allows us to write programs very succinctly here. Yeah, I mean, it allows us to write more programs in some sense. So that to include a recursion, what we have to do is we have to add one more case to the definition of expression. And that case looks like this. We said that rec, and then variable x, in deep one. So one thing I want you to notice is that, so that reg is like a defining some variable x. But one thing I want you to notice is that this by syntax, x always have to be a function. Okay, furthermore, so in a sense, runtime type of x is a fixed, it's gonna be a function. Furthermore, we know that x will, definition of x that the right hand side of the definition of x will always terminate because it's in the canonical form. Okay, so, so this syntax really looks, up, I mean, the very innocent, doesn't do anything, but it makes some design decision. The decision is that when we define something recursively, this recursively defined stuff has to be only functions and my definitions of this recursive, I mean, the definition of this recursively defined x has to be in the canonical form. So it should immediately terminate when we evaluate this. And then when we inside this, uh, we this recursive definition can be used inside the e file. So this restriction about function canonical form are very important, and they are related to the to the issues that I explained in the beginning of the lecture. So let me show you one example, and then maybe finish. Uh, so, so one thing that if, before doing so, the one thing that one you can easily notice in this definition of a canonical form is that if you now want to define the free variable, and so actually the I think I should have written like this. So far, GXP. And it's, so if you have a free variable of the free variables, I mean, because X appearing inside the E is gonna be bound to X because it's a recursive definition. So we have to compute free variable like this, compute free variables of E subtract Y because Y is bound and take 
a union of three variable of this one, but then we subtract x everywhere because x is because we really define. Then I mean, just give me two minutes. I'm gonna finish by giving one example of this recursion. So now how to use this recursion? And this recursion can be used to compute. I mean, what I try to do with the this tree example that I showed you. So suppose I want to add all the values in the tree, like three, four, five in the tree. And then we can write a simple routine by combining some case and this left reg. So here's how we can do this. So we'll define the recursive function, which say add every element, every values in the leaf of the tree. So it takes some tree as a parameter, and then we, we do case analysis. So we look at the case analysis of the tree. If the tree is a leaf, which in that case, the tree, the, after the pack tree will be some integer. In this case, we just return integer. Otherwise, if tree is a node, so then we make a recursive call of head on the left hand side of the tree. And then also we make a recursive call on the right hand side of the tree. And that's going to be what we're going to do in the node case. And finally, in, if we can, in the left bracket, we can return head to give a, to return the recursive defined, defined entity. I mean, the syntax of this language that we are I'm presenting is not the best one. I mean, it's not most convenient one, but I hope that things I may, mean, it's designed to make things clear. So it, even though it looks a bit, not a bit clumsy in some places, it still carries key ideas of the, of the language design. Okay, so that's it for today. And I hope, and thank you all for coming. And I hope to see you again on Wednesday.